All right, we're going live in two, one. Hey. Hey. All right, we are live. Good morning, those of you joining us from Facebook. If you want to drop in the comments where you're coming from today, whether you're in your home district of where you teach or if you're out at the lake or enjoying a vacation, that is awesome and we are so excited you are joining us. Let us know where you're coming from and let us know what you teach. We'd love to know that and um, be ready to connect with you. We're gonna get started here in just about a minute. We're gonna make sure everything is working. We're going to get rocking. We've got a great tour for you today. Craig Fisher is here with us live on video from Sleepy Bison Acres in Sleepy Eye, Minnesota. And Craig's wife, Elizabeth Fisher, is actually on the Facebook chat with us this morning. And we are excited. She's going to be able to answer a few of the quick questions that come up. We want you to be able to ask your questions as Craig is speaking. So Craig is gonna take us on a tour of his farm in just a little bit. And we wanna know what questions you have for the Fishers. Elizabeth will be answering on text and Craig will be able to answer once he kind of gets done with the topic he is discussing. It looks like we've got 67 eyeballs on here so far. Again, welcome this morning. We want to know where you are tuning in from and what you teach today as we gear up to hear from Craig. Our topic today is going to be farm to fork. So Craig is going to walk us through for the next 40 minutes of what he raises out at his farm in Sleepy Eye, Minnesota. And then we're going to be joined by, um, totally lost it, Dave Forrester and his wife, who are going to be tuning in from Sleepy Eye Coffee Company to share about how they utilize local resources for their business. We have a lot. We are going to get started. Thank you so much to everybody who is tuning in. And yes, thank you for all those comments. You know what, Craig? I say we're ready to rock. So all everyone, right. please meet my new friend and awesome agricultural guru, Craig Fisher from Sleepy Eye Bison Acres. Good morning, Craig. Morning. All right. All we're right. ready for you. So um, my wife, Elizabeth, and I, we own Sleepy Bison Acres. We started this in 2013. Um, we actually started, we got a bison as a wedding gift from our mentors in Byron, which is close to Rochester. Um, we had been looking into the bison industry for several years and they wanted to help us get started. So they gifted us one and with the agreement that we purchase another, because you can't just have one bison alone. They're a herd animal. You want to have at least two. Um, so from there, we purchased a herd bull and two younger females, and we've kind of grown it from there. Last year, we hit 45 animals, 45 bison. Um, we also pasture pigs in the woods, and we have free range egg layers. So we had 35 pigs last year. Uh, we, had, we have about 115 egg laying chickens and another 100 chicks, about six roosters and four guineas. So. Um, you may hear a little noise in the background if, if the chickens are making some racket, they're laying eggs right now. So just wanted to give you a tour of the operation and uh, kind of give you a feel for, for what we raise and why we raise it. Neighbor just drove by in the tractor. You got a wave in the country here. So, um, okay, so why we started raising bison, um, my family actually has had some, some heart history, heart health history, and bison is one of the meats that the American Heart Association has endorsed for decades as a healthy red meat. 
it made sense. They're cool. They're athletic. I played college baseball. I appreciate athleticism and the adrenaline rush. Um, so bison were a fit um, in our mind. It's something different. Um, in the 80s, there was a phrase, you get big or get out. And we kind of did a play on words there. We, we started saying, get big, get out, or get different. So we chose to get different. Um, so that's kind of the overall view of, of the farm. And really, we just wanted to know where our food was coming from. And we wanted to really, um, we wanted to have a better understanding of where the food's coming from, how it's produced, and have a better connection with that food and provide some value for the local community, have a healthy option for the community. So that's why we got started. So I'll give you a little tour of the bison, the chickens, and the pigs. So, um, sorry, I got my shovel here. I'm figuring this out. Okay, so this is what I'm looking at here. Uh, my great grandpa um, bought this place back in the 50s, I believe. And um, so I'm fourth generation here. Um, my boys are fifth generation. Elizabeth and I have three boys. Um, and uh, yeah, we're just raising the kids out in the country. So we have the bison, all of our animals, all of our animals, they get a locally sourced feed ration and they also are on pasture. We try and rotate them around on pasture, trying to do a mix of um, impact and recovery. So I'll get to that in a little bit here. Um, this little area here is where I have been dumping the, um, the spent grains from the brewery in Sleepy Eye. And we have a unique relationship with the brewery in Sleepy Eye. We get the spent grains from them, feed it to the bison, and um, then we end up bringing the bison back after they're harvested to the coffee shop, which shares location with the brewery. And the coffee shop will make sandwiches and market that meat to consumers through the restaurant. So that's what the spent grains are here. But uh, the chickens think I have treats, so they're all coming up here. Um, I'll show you the latest and greatest. <laughs> it's a old livestock trailer that we had converted into a mobile chicken coop. So all of the little chicks here, we have about 100 of them. We're trying to train them to go into the mobile chicken coop so that we can keep moving them across the pasture, across the grass, and um, get them to lay eggs in there and also spread manure as we move the trailer. So they just roost in here, keeps them safe from any raccoons, possums, skunks, fox, eagles, owls, anything that likes to eat chicken, which is like everything. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So the chickens, they can free range across the yard. They can go in the pasture. They can go in the woods by the pigs. The bison, they can go out by them. Um, they can go wherever they want. Just as long as it's not the front porch or in the flower bed, we're good with it. So chickens kind of have a free reign of, of the yard and of the place. And that actually helps contribute to a higher quality egg. Um, if you look at a egg yolk, from a farm like, like ours, the yolk tends to be a lot more orange and that indicates a nutrient density of that egg. And the nutrient density helps contribute to overall health of the people that are eating it. So the humans that are eating a nutrient dense food like these eggs um, typically have lower cholesterol. It's actually a good balance of good cholesterol and um, really contributes to overall health. So we like our chickens going wherever they be. And there's a guinea right there. That's a guinea right there. So um, the guineas make a lot of noise, but uh, we really like them because they eat a lot of ticks. So I am going to walk out to the pasture here. I have to climb the fence, keep an eye on the bison while I walk out to the pasture and show you what we're looking for. So the bison are actually up in the 
in the lot right now. They came up, they're getting some grains, they're getting some hay, and they're just kind of lounging right now. But here's the pasture. We split our pasture up into different, different paddocks and um, trying to do a rest and rotation cycle. I gotta keep my eye on these guys. Some of the younger bulls, older bulls that we have here at home. Um, at home, we have the animals that end up that are going to be harvested next. So we bring we bring the calves back home from the other farm. We have another farm that's about 25 miles to the west that a friend owns. We have our cows and our bulls over there. And when the calves get old enough, they come back home, and then we are able to give them this nice lush green forage salad bar and we're able to really give them a diverse menu of items to eat so this here is an alleyway where they can get out the gate from the lot out to the pasture and this is exactly what we want to do out in the pasture we want that tall forage right there we want to take about 50 percent of it and lay the rest of it down. When we do that, the soil is protected from the sun. It's not drying out. When that soil is protected, then that means that all the microorganisms and the worms and everything beneficial in the soil that helps make healthy soil and nutrient dense food, those are protected as well. So that's kind of what I'm hoping to show you here is a progression. So this alleyway here, the bison have been utilizing for about five days. It was about three feet tall. And um, they laid it down. They did a really good job of creating a nice thick mat. It's just like gardening. Same theory. You are trying to create an environment where the plant species that you want can grow and thrive. So out in the pasture here, this is where I opened up for them here two days ago. And two days ago, that was also three feet tall. Yesterday, I let them into this other area here. And you may notice that there's all these weeds out here, what some people call weeds, other people call them forbs. And some of these plants here, some of these forbs, this is a uh, poison eye, well, this is burn weed, I would call it, or um, burning nettles. You look right here, a bison actually took a bite off of there. So it's getting some nutritional benefit from it, but really these weeds are indicating that there's a, um, there's something that it needs to balance out. Nature is trying to balance itself out We've been feeding hay out here, trying to build our soil up because we had converted this from row crop land that my dad had farmed back to pasture. And typically it doesn't look good when you plant it back to grass. There's not a whole lot of soil health activity. Um, there's a different balance between most cropland and healthy pasture and i'm not saying all cropland but we're trying to regenerate this land make it better so that the bison have this healthy food to eat which creates a healthy food item for us too so hey craig really weeds. quick how many yes. how much area do they have in each paddock oh thank you yeah um we have our farm site is 12 acres. We have four acres for the bison, four acres for the pigs in the woods, and four acres for us and the chickens. So the bison have seven different paddocks here. So each one of these larger paddocks, I had walked by a silver wire before, each one of those paddocks is approximately two thirds of one acre. So then this wire right here, I use to um, create a portable fence. 
So this wire is electrified. It would uh, hurt, kind of like if somebody hits you in the arm with a hammer, if you touch it, it uh, has a powerful little jolt. So this is about waist high. And we're just trying to get something at the nose height of the bison. So we have them split down onto roughly two tenths of an acre. So this two thirds of an acre paddock, we're gonna divide by three, split it into three different sections. So two tenths of an acre. Some of the bison are starting to come out here. So I'll have to keep an eye on things here. But um, yeah, so we split it up and we want, we, we're trying to build our soil up. And if we're able to build our soil up, that makes a healthier product oh. for the bison and a healthier product for us. Craig, I think we lost your video. Okay. Carrie, is that accurate? Oh, there you he's back. Yep. Okay. We could right. hear you. We just couldn't see you for a second there. Okay. Sorry about that. That's okay. I'm gonna make my way over this way. So yeah, and as you're as you're walking, yeah. we got a great question from John. He asked that cattle farming can have a higher carbon footprint compared to other livestock. Can you tell us if bison farming has a lower carbon footprint than cattle? Ah, sorry, I had to slip under a fence there. <laughs> um, <laughs> so in terms of carbon footprint, I'm assuming they're, they're asking, you know, is it beneficial for the environment? Um, okay, so you can have a positive impact or you can have a negative impact. So bison, basically the ice age and the big herds of bison and elk, they built the prairie. They built the black soils that Southern Minnesota enjoys. And Iowa, I mean, you had, oh, look at them come up close. Iowa had big herds. They had all kinds of diverse animals. These prairies, these rich soils are built by animals. So, yes, bison have a positive carbon impact, but it does have something to do with management. So any type of animal can be mismanaged and have a poor impact on the environment. So we as land managers, are trying to make a positive impact on the environment and a positive impact within our community. So whether that's meat or building up our soil, um, we can increase the water infiltration, water retention, um, really being, make clean water, basically anything, so many of these key environmental question marks um, we can address those with proper land management and really make I it a benefit. That. Yeah, perfect. Since those There's bison some... are so close, I have a, a question yeah. from Bridget. She says, yep. I have seen more extensive fencing for bison. Do you have different fencing <laughs> on the perimeter as you do inside each paddock? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, um, I'll get to that in a little bit. I'll turn behind me here. So we have two lots that have highway guardrail and that guardrail is spaced out so that the animals can't get out. We have to have one area where if we bring animals in, we need to progressively train them. So we try and train our animals down to one wire. So that's what our portable fencing is, is one wire. Yes, it takes time um, to get them down to that one wire but we can move them from the three guardrails out to the pasture, which is a high tensile woven wire fence with a hot wire inside that. And then the fence, I had to slip underneath here, is three wires. So we just kind of make a prog progression from the more fortified fence down to something a little more manageable down to that one wire, which gives us a creative, uh, flexible um, template. So. I love that. And 
Uh, people have been asking about your other pasture and just really quickly, I was very shocked to see that you had portable fencing in your other pasture. Do you wanna talk just a little bit about that other pasture before we get back to the soil? Um, the one that I just jumped out of, that pasture? No, sorry, or the pasture on the other farm. Oh, okay. The pasture on the other farm is uh, hilly and at home we're pretty flat. So it's a lot easier to do the portable fencing on flat ground. You can do it on the hills, but you actually have to be more mindful. You have to use more posts. You have to take into consideration like putting the posts and the wire on a certain side of the hill so the animals see it. You wanna put it at the top of the hill instead of towards the bottom of the hill that they put on the brakes, but they can't stop and go through. Um, there's just a few more considerations. But, um, actually, I hear something in the wind here. This is one of the tools that we use to train the bison to the hot wires. Um, we can hang a hop can on the wire and that wire is electrocuted. So if they touch that with their nose, they can make that association that that is somewhere that they shouldn't be or shouldn't touch. So that becomes their new fence. So um, when we first walked in, that is the kind of pasture that we want. We want a nice thick grass pasture with some legumes in it, a very diverse forage for the animals. And this paddock here um, is a little bit behind soil health wise. We're still trying to build that up, but um, these weeds are basically showing that we're putting more nutrients on than, than nature knows what to do with right now. So it, nature just is building building its metabolism up and the weeds are helping heal that soil so that it can jump to the next level like that last paddock was. So, um, and then this paddock here, this was grazed about five days ago. So I'd split this up into two different areas. And that we actually took too much of our forage off. Like I said before, we wanna shoot for 50%. If we get that 50% mark, there's enough for the, the microbe herd under the soil as well as our herd above the soil. We have a nice balance of nutrition for both parties. So most people um, are not aware that you have a herd of microbes under the soil that you also need to feed. Um, in a healthy soil, you have the equivalent to two elephants per acre that you need to feed just in healthy soil. So I'm gonna walk over here and we're gonna take a we're gonna take a look at the soil. So if I there's any it. questions. Yeah, you know, um, we've got I a couple other like questions. I I you might have mentioned this, but just really quickly, how long do you have bison in each paddock? That really depends. So okay. we need to we need to monitor how much forage we have um, for the bison and we need to monitor Basically, you're, you're balancing supply and demand. How much supply do you have and how much demand do you have? So if you have 10 animals, you can be in a paddock a different time than if you had 100 animals. So you do have to use some math skills to get to that balance. Um, if we had 100 animals on here, we might only be in here for like an hour. If we have our 10 animals on here, we can be on here for a day. So again, it's just, it's supply and demand. Yep. So, um, yeah. I love it. Another question we had as you're walking to your soil spot is um, out at Minneopa State Park, they are trying to raise their herd without any cattle DNA. Do you <laughs> know if your herd is more bison or also has cattle DNA? And actually, if you want to, now would be a great time to talk a little bit about breeds too. I know you did that the other okay. day. Sure. Yeah, there was um, the known accounts. There was six different bison species at one time. Now we have one bison species left. Um, there was also 43 different subspecies. And now there is three left. So in Minnesota, in the United States, basically it was the Plains bison that was the normal 
animal that we would see in Canada, the woods bison were up north. And then in Europe, uh, Russia, actually, there's the European bison. They're also called the Weissant. Um, so those are probably the most rare, but basically all of the different subspecies have been hunted to a different extent and all of them have suffered from hunting, lack of um, habitat or loss of habitat. And uh, we're just trying to build the animals back. So the American Plains bison is the most common in the world. Um, the woods bison is also relatively common, um, but not quite as much. So our herd bull, Pablo, is actually half woods bison and half plains bison. So a lot of ours are hybrids of the two subspecies. Um, the woods bison are actually 10% bigger taller their hump is further forward um, they weigh more so that's one of the the weight you know we get the value from the bison at the end of the day from the meat we're marketing the meat we're selling direct to consumers we're selling to restaurants schools um, we're doing bulk quarters and halves that's what ends up paying the bills so that's why some people would hybridize the woods bison with the plains bison to try and get that bigger animal. So um, as far as our herd, we don't have it in our budget to test all of the animals that we have, but we have had some of our animals that we have sold tested by other producers and everything has come back clean of cattle DNA. Um, I actually, my personal opinion and opinions from the National Bison Association and the Minnesota Bison Association is that the cattle DNA is a lot less of an issue than what some people believe. And other than, I mean, I don't really want to get into it, but it's not as prevalent as, as you would think um, or as some people believe, but it depends who you talk to. Um, but as for us, it's not an issue. So we've bought our animals from reputable herds. Ours trace back to Teddy Roosevelt National Park, Blue Mountain State Park. Um, so, Very yeah. cool. I love it. Yeah. Let's look for some worms. Okay. So what, <laughs> what we try and look for is monitoring our soil health. And one of the easiest ways that we can do so is to look for worms. Worms are a good indicator that there's something there for the microbes to eat and that there's plenty of moisture in the soil that our soil is balanced. So I just walked out into the pasture here. We got this the bison had been in here about a week and a half ago. So this is another four or five days progressed from the last one. And I just dug up Sorry, I just dug up this piece of soil here. So typically about 80% of your soil life is in the top two inches. So what we wanna look for is that we're doing a good job. So just on this random hit with the shovel, that's, sorry, that's manure. Okay, so that's good. We have a good, um, we're fertilizing the land, putting some nutrients back. And I just flipped this over. There's a worm right there. See, there's another worm right there. See some manure mixed in with that shovel full. So we can actually count the worms that are in here. And another thing we wanna do is we wanna smell the soil, see how it smells. Um, if something smells bad, you know, if we crack an egg open in the kitchen and then we smell it and it smells bad we don't want to eat it right it's the same theory with your soil um, the animals aren't going to be so inclined to eat something that is grown out of smelly soil so if you smell it you don't want an acidic or metallic smell if so you know that there's definitely an imbalance you actually want your soil to be nice and crumbly it's kind of like chocolate cake so you want different texture. You want roots in there. 
So what that does is it allows the water to penetrate through the soil. There you can see the crumbles. You want that water to penetrate through the soil and you want different pore spaces in there. So oxygen is actually in the soil. When soil gets compacted, when something drives over it heavy or you are grazing an area for too long, animals walk around right after a big rainstorm for too long, um, then it becomes compacted. You start having issues. Your soil life can't function. Your nutrient cycle gets broken. Your water cycle, your water can't penetrate. So if you see after a big rain event and there's water sitting in the field, that's what's going on. Your water can't get down. There's, there's not enough pore space in that soil for your water to get down. And your nutrients are probably having an issue, a problem getting into that plant that you're trying to produce. So we can just shred this apart and look for, look for different worms. So we can do a worm count and based off that worm count, we can determine how we're doing with our grazing. So just wanted to show you that. I'll flop that back in here, put my soil and manure back so that the worms are protected. Sun is coming out here this morning. So that's what we want. Excellent. So. And I just have to give a quick shout out. Elizabeth is firing answers back so quickly. <laughs> so thank you so much, Elizabeth, for helping us out. Craig has so much to share today, you guys, that I wanted to make sure all of your questions got answered. And yet we still got to see everything on the farm. So Craig, as you are moving here, oh, yep. you know what? I had to exit out of the video. I lost the question I wanted. Uh, Sam has asked, when you started the pastures, did you source organic fertilizers? And I believe Elizabeth answered it with, we let the animals condition the land. I didn't know if you had anything else to, to add to that. Yeah, okay, so we don't use any synthetic chemicals, fertilizers. Um, really we're working with nature we're trying to work with nature to build it back up so the we're rolling hay out on the pasture and we're using the animals to build that soil back up so we're controlling the impact that they have on the land and thus we're able to build our soil up so when i dug down into the soil and i found that little manure pat that's our fertilizer program. So we're bringing hay in, the hay has nutrients, it has nitrogen, it has phosphorus, it has anything that you really want. The bison, their manure increases organic matter on the soil, it increases the nitrogen um, that the plants need to grow green and healthy. And then the urine from the bison is actually highly beneficial. It's water and urea, which urea is one of the mainstays of the um, commodity crop program. So um, we really try and work with nature to build it up and we avoid um, any unnecessary inputs as much as we can. So I hope I answered that. Yeah, excellent. All right, let's head okay. to those piggies. I do wanna give you a seven minute warning. So we have seven okay. minutes left of the tour okay. on your farm and I see Dave has joined us. So Dave from Sleepy Eye Coffee Company will be joining cool. us here in about seven minutes. So yeah, let's keep her rolling. Questions, right, this is, ladies and gentlemen, keep them, keep them coming. We're, we're ready for you. This is the exterior of the bison pasture. So we have a hot wire at six feet and then the high tensile woven wire fence is not electrocuted, but we have another hot wire that's inset just off the fence. So the animals can actually hit this and bounce off of it. It's plenty sturdy um, to keep the animals in. So that's that's our big safety net. You wanna make sure with any animal that you have a proper exterior fence because if these animals do not stay in to your interior fence, as long as you can contain them in the exterior, you're okay. Um, you can bring them back in, you can retrain them, you can do what you have to as long as they stay in the exterior. So with the pigs, 
This is one of the paddocks that we moved them out of two days ago, right before the rainstorm or during the rainstorm. And we moved them into this one. So this one here, they were in here or they've been in here for two days now and they have just turned this over and made it nice and black. <laughs> they, they like it a little black, but um, this is how it started out. Lots of plants growing. Lots of plants growing out here. And I was actually looking for the pigs, wondering where they are. But, um, this is what it looked like before. It took them two days to work that down. Again, it's supply and demand. We're trying to balance how many days the pigs are in this paddock. They have a constant feeder. They have old uh, calf huts from dairy operation, which was my grandparents. Um, that becomes their barn. Our pigs do not grow in a barn when they get here. They live outside, they eat outside. We're trying to regenerate our woods by using pigs. So they're out on the edge of the paddock there, they're checking things out and they will pile some brush on the wire. So every now and then we gotta check, check our fence out, make sure that there's not a bunch of branches on the wire, that the wire is down the same fencing system as we use for the bison. We train the pigs down to one hot wire. So the pigs are coming over here, checking out what's going on. And if that pig touches that wire, it will get shocked and it will probably squeal kind of loud. <laughs> so um, pigs are curious animals, just like the bison. And that can be used to your advantage if you know how to use it properly. That pig is getting awfully close. Oh, there we go. That was a pig getting shocked. So again, um, we just try and train the animals to a portable fencing system so that we can change our needs as nature is changing too. So do we have time yet? You know, we're down to three minutes. What breed are those pigs again? Okay, so we, we pretty well focus on heritage breeds of pigs. They like to forage more, they like to exercise a lot more, so their muscle muscle composition is much better. Um, we find that they're a little hardier, and um, we have done the confinement pigs before, but we really like the heritage pigs. So the red ones there, those are Durox. Those are typically one of the high-end breeds um, in terms of customer perception. We got a Hampshire pig right there and an old spot. And that was a Duroc right there. And again, so, from when you get your pigs to yeah. when they go for processing, how does that work for you on the farm? Um, when we get them in, we have to train them. So we'll actually use the bison lot to train the pigs. And we train them to the hot wire. They've never seen a hot wire when they come in. Before they go out into the woods, they need to be, they need to understand that that is their new um, parameter fence. So as we go through the woods, we go through in about a quarter acre at a time, we'll make a fence line through the woods out to the exterior and we'll hook onto that electric fence out there. And the pigs are in here from anywhere from three days to two weeks, depending on their age and how many we have. So we have 35 pigs again here this year. And when they're little, they can be out a little more when they're bigger. We have to move them faster because their demand is a lot higher. And how long are they on your farm for? We got this batch in April and the last of these will go out in October. So. And this is a great segue. We've got about one minute left. Craig, first off, I just want to thank you and Elizabeth so much for taking us out on your farm and showing us everything you do. But obviously, tell us a little bit what happens to your bison meat and your um, and your pork. Right. So um, we have a website that we started up here before COVID had hit, actually. Um, so people can order our bison meat, our pork through our website. They can come to the Mankato Farmers Market and see us there and order there and then we were working with seven different restaurants and talking with a few different schools um, before COVID hit. And 
that kind of went to a standstill. So we really doubled down on the direct to consumer part, part of it. We have had some restaurants that are still going, but um, it's kind of a fraction of what it was. So we've really enjoyed, since we doubled down with the consumers, we've really enjoyed building different relationships with different people and trying to build that camaraderie, that, that loyalty, um, that value that we can promote. I so. love it. And Elizabeth, I was just about to say, um, we are going to put your website and we will still on the Facebook page. So anybody can go check them out. They are on Facebook as well. Uh, but Elizabeth just popped your link right in there. I love it. Well, thank <laughs> you so much, Craig. I am going to transition over to Dave and uh, feel free to stay on, but we're going to sign off if you're good with that. All right, cool. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks. Oops. <laughs> All right, Dave, I am ready for your video feed. You wanna go ahead and unmute yourself. All right, we can see you guys. All right, we're ready. How are you guys this morning? Great, great. So I've got Samara with me, my wife, um, and she runs the kitchen and comes up with the recipes and, and was really the, um, the instigator here to get us started as we were developing our menu at Sleepy Eye Coffee before we opened last summer to find um, what we could locally as much as possible. And that led us to Craig. We kind of just serendipitously fell into just the right area for him to work with us. Mm -hmm. Well, perfect. Tell us, um, let's start with the operation. Tell us what a Sleepy Eye Coffee Company is new. And so tell us a little bit about that. And then we want to know, it's Samara, right? Yep. Samara, we want to know how you are using local foods within your, um, your operation there in the kitchen. Okay. Well, um, so the coffee shop, we're located inside of an old uh, movie theater um, and we share the space with the brewery. Um, so we kind of all, we, the relationship, you know, it's, we try to use each other's products as much as we can. Like I am right now using um, their beer to braise a roast that Craig dropped off yesterday. So <laughs> I yeah. love it. it's sitting in the oven right now. It's we're gonna make um like a bison pull a pulled bison Asian street taco. So it's gonna be pretty yummy. But All right, we, I'll be there for lunch. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we use like as, as many local products as we can, like hyper local. Uh, we use obviously Craig's bison and pork. Um, we use eggs from uh, Cypher. Yes, yeah, yeah. poultry. And then we have two different apiaries that we buy our honey from. And I use honey for so many things like boiling bagels to making honey butter to uh, baste our sandwiches in and things like that. Um, and in our coffee drinks too. Um, we buy our milk from the grocery store down the street. We buy our cheese from the, the butcher shop that's literally right across the alley. Um, and then as far as like Minnesota grown, we buy all of our chai from Grey Duck Chai. They're located in um, the Twin Cities. And then we have uh, our sauces, like all of our, um, the sauces we use on our sandwiches are from a place called Freak Flag Foods in St. Paul. <laughs> So yeah, we try to get as much as we can locally and all of my, all of the bread is made in house from scratch. Yeah, it can be, it can be a challenge um, being in a small town about two hours from the Twin Cities to get ingredients. There are some routes that don't come through here, but if it, you know, a little extra work, we find that it's, it's worth it, even if it's, um, you know, not quite as easy as it would be uh, otherwise. So uh, we've had, we opened, we're coming up on our one year anniversary. We started in October of last year and it's just beat everybody's expectations. I mean, we were confident that this was gonna work well here, 
but um, just the quality of what we're putting out and um, reusing an old building in a small town that people really loved and wanted to see reused along with the menu um, and the just the local connections with the ingredients that we can use goes a long way. That's awesome. Heidi and Lynn are enjoying a cup of coffee from Sleepy Eye Coffee Company right now. Cheers. Right. <laughs> yes, for those of you who do not know, the first 60 registrants of our Minnesota Summer Teacher Tour, we were able to score them some Sleepy Eye Coffee Company coffee that got delivered in their ag bags. So those of you who signed up right away, we are excited that you've got that coffee and enjoy it. Um, Dave and Samara, what would you say, what is, so many times we see small businesses using more local resources. Why is that important to our communities? And why is that important? Why is that something that is important to your, to the business of Sleepy Eye Coffee Company? Well, the, for me, the biggest thing is it's, it's supporting other people's livelihood, you know, so it, one of the challenges of living in a smaller town or in a rural community is finding employment and uh, drawing people here and uh, giving them a place to work. So if we can support, you know, the growers and the, and the other people who are trying to make a, a go of it, um, that's a huge benefit aside from, you know, the quality and having the, the freshness that maybe some Samara can talk to it. When we got the eggs from the free range grower, uh, who's also a veteran, by the way, he was um, just activated. He came back uh, from the Twin Cities and two days later, he, he dropped off some eggs for us. So it's just having that strong connection. And the eggs were just like twice the size. Of what it was we're the size from. of my hand. Yeah. Like, <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Granted, I have small hands, but you know. <laughs> and how many doubles are you getting all the, I mean. I have yeah, those. like the twins, I'll crack them open and it'll be twins every yeah. time. So. So the other day he brought, he actually harvested to them that morning from the, from the coop and brought them to our shop that morning. Yeah. It's, it's all about me, uh, giving people something that they can't buy, you know, there's a subway down the road and, you know, we eat there all the time, but it's about making a product that's different and something they can't get somewhere else. They can't get in sleepy eye that they would have to travel for. And a lot of people will say when they walk into the building too, like this is something that you would expect to see in the cities, you know, it's, yes. it's, um, it's different. And that's kind of what we're, what we wanted to, to go for. And I know the arm Brewsters, the owners of the, the coffee shop in the building, they, they really wanted to, it was important to them to really revitalize main street and make it look like, you know, give it a facelift, give people a reason to stop. Like there has to be a reason for cars to want to stop on main street and, you know, fill it up again, make, foot traffic happen again. And um, I think by really supporting our community that way and supporting the local farmers and all of that sort of thing. And I mean, even local businesses, our aprons were embroidered by uh, a local lady. Yeah. So um, in our mugs, we have these really great hand spun mugs from uh, Deneen Pottery um, Saint Paul. in St. Paul. And Craig's so. uh, people, I, I hopefully we help uh, spread the word about his product too. We have um, uh, uh, 4th of July uh, bison burger kits that we're going to be selling here. Yes. And same thing for Memorial Day. So people are starting to yeah, kind of. They go crazy for that bison. <laughs> they love it. They do. So tell me a little bit about that. I know um, during COVID, we saw that you guys had some takeout where you could like make and take. Are you continuing to do that? And then I'd also love to know, I mean, are your doors open? We've got a lot of people on here who are saying, if you're ever near sleepy eye, you got to stop in, you got to stop in. What's the, what's the situation like right now? Yeah, we're open um, and we are taking reservations. Um, it makes it easier to make sure you can get a table, but we've never been at capacity yet. Um, but I'm sure it'll get there soon. Um, business is definitely ramping up a little bit, um, but during, the shutdown, I was actually doing way more work than typical because usually our business is, um, you know, like 50% coffee, 50% food. Um, but we were having a lot less people coming in to buy like coffee drinks and a lot more people calling and saying, Hey, can I send 125 cheesecakes to the hospital? <laughs> or I'd wow. like, I'd like to supply my entire company like uh, that was 114 family-sized dinners. I want to treat my whole company to dinner tonight. 
Um, oh, that just gave me goosebumps. That's yeah. amazing. So it was, it was pretty, pretty brutal for a couple of weeks, like trying to get all that food out, but it was great at the same time, you know, like we, we had some really great big orders, like big business, even though we didn't have foot traffic coming in, it was really great to see all of the, um, the, the support locally again, like people really wanted to support us. And then like the people got really excited about those grilling kits because yes. you know, like said, they love, they love Craig's bison meat and, you know, you give them something like it, it included, um, you know, the fresh patties that I season, um, and then fresh bread to serve the, the burgers on chips and all of the fixings like bacon and all the sauces and, you know, lettuce and tomatoes, and then two pounds of homemade mac and cheese and can't beat that. So they can't really beat not. it. And it's still available. Are you saying um, it's available for 4th of July? What's the, what's the situation? How do we get that? Yeah, you can order it online. I've got 25 of them left. So you do have to come to sleep. You have to pick it up though. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> you can mail it. <laughs> But yeah, they're, they're going to go fast for sure. All right. Well, perfect. Is there anything else you guys would love to add? We are, we are right on time and we just want to thank you guys so much for sharing. I love this farm to fork opportunity that's right here in Southern Minnesota. And we just thank you guys for everything you're doing too. Thank you. And thanks for everything everybody else does out there to spread the word. And we're just excited to be, hopefully this, you know, continues to grow in other towns and rural areas and, and in the cities as well. Yeah. I love that. Give inspiration for other towns to continue bringing people back to uh, what every, you know, every town is unique and has something to offer. And I love that. Well, perfect. Well, thank you guys so much. I'm going to give about a 10 second um, pause here before I, shut off the live video. A lot of times it'll cut off on its own, but thank you guys so much. And I'll be swinging in and seeing your faces soon. Thanks.